Hi, I'm Scott Kimball, and welcome to Generally Speaking, the Herkimer College Podcast. Our guest today is an esteemed alumnus of the college, and he has also become a giant in the Syracuse sports journalism world, Mr. Brent Axe. Brent, thank you for coming on. Thank you for braving the weather to come down and join us today. Yeah, I mean, look, it's April. It snows in April in central New York. but Imagine that. I couldn't believe I left Syracuse. It's raining. I get to Herkimer, and there's a foot of snow on the ground. It's incredible. (laughs) Big words there, by the way. Esteemed, giant, like very, very nice of you to say, Scott. Absolutely. I, I appreciate that. And it's, it's our pleasure to have you here. This is just great. Uh, so before we get into talking about sports journalism, I want to talk about your path to what was then HCCC. Wow. So I, I'm at Bishop Ludden High School in Syracuse. This is 1994-95. So when I went to Bishop Ludden, I was always in the hallways talking sports with my friends and just kind of like doing a talk show, doing a podcast, if you will, in the hallway, right? Mm-hmm. So when I was at Bishop Ludden, Sister Nancy did the morning announcements. And Sister Nancy was very <laughs> monotone like this and said everything in the same voice. And she actually came to me and asked me to do the morning announcements because she didn't like doing it. And she kind of picked up on the fact that maybe that's something I would like to do. So I started doing more of like a morning show. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Morning announcements. I was a huge David Letterman fan at the time. So I was doing top 10 lists and just goofing around and doing sports scores. And Were you doing stupid pet tricks? I did not do stupid <laughs> pet tricks. And I was doing it in a, a little closet. It, there was a microphone in there. I think Marconi himself put there in the 1930s. <laughs> but, man, to their credit, they let me try and experiment. Believe me, there were some conversations about some things you can and can't do. <laughs> uh, played some music on the, the loudspeakers at a Catholic school they didn't appreciate. But they let me do it, and they let me experiment, and they let me try it. And they can kind of see that it could lead me down a path, right? So I was doing that, and then at the same time when I was in high school, Z89, a Syracuse University radio station, they used to let high school kids come in during breaks just to kind of help out, keep keep the lights on, keep the place going, because they didn't have enough staff to keep things going. So, okay. boy, they let me do everything there at Z89, on and off the air, whatever needed to be done. And I learned so much about radio and, and, and the business and, and just kind of what it was all about. So then in 1996, I graduated from high school, and I remember this like it was yesterday. I'm starting to look at schools, and I was a lacrosse player, and I knew I was going to go to a community college, right? We had OCC in Syracuse, but I remember looking at the brochure with my dad, and I saw in the list of majors, I'm like, radio, television? Like, they, that's a major? Like, even though I'm working at the student radio station, it didn't, like, process to me. Sure, like, sure. This is what you can do. <laughs> so I saw that. My dad and I came. We visited. I just fell in love with the place. The people that were a part of WVHC, the radio station here, were a part of the radio television broadcasting. I, 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 I didn't get out of the parking lot before I was like, I'm in. I am going to come here to Herkimer. And I just fell in love with it then. And just the opportunities that came, as I'm sure we'll talk about while I was here. And I was a lacrosse player, too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Paul Wareham. Oh, yes. Back in Absolutely. the day. The, Herc was winning all the titles. So Another legend. Another legend. Absolutely. Do you want to talk about legend? <laughs> we could do a whole show on Paul Wareham. So I was like, all right, great. Go grab a title or two, play lacrosse, get in the media world a little bit. Like, what could be greater than that for an 18-year-old kid? Absolutely. And, you know, we had that television uh, studio downstairs. Which, by the way, I don't know if you know or not, but that's all part of the police academy now. I heard it's, it's I a saw virtual. That. It's it's quite yeah. a setup down there. We did so much in that television studio. We again, what you have to do when you're a college student, what do you have to do if you want to get into this business or any business, you just have to do it. You have to try it. But we didn't have YouTube then. The internet was in its infancy. We didn't have all these opportunities. Social media, of course, didn't exist. That's where that was our social media. Right. That's where we tried stuff. We went in that TV studio, and we just tried to figure it out, right? And there, where we sit now, WVHC, and, and now to see it come full circle, and you guys have this podcast, and the opportunity for students to just jump in and do it. Like, that's what you have to do. We had our own version of it way back in the day, back in the 90s, and, and now it's amazing to see how it's, it's come full circle to, to where we are now. But you did have HCTV. I remember that being on, on the public we access. Did. I remember being able to watch that and thinking, how cool is that 
that something like that is being produced right here in Herkimer. Absolutely. And I remember Joe Kelly used to do the Joe Kelly show. For the Observer Dispatch, right? He, so not only for uh, for the OD, but I believe it was for WKTV. Okay. Or WTR. I can't remember which station it was. And how cool was that? That they let us run camera and do graphics. And uh, every aspect of that show was student produced, right? Like just to learn about that and, and see what was happening here. And that's what I loved about Herkimer. That's what I loved about coming here. It's like, you did not have time to mess around. Like you came in and you are in the fire. You're doing it. You're part of it. When I was here in my first semester, I got my internship at WIBX radio. So not only was I doing it here, I had the opportunity to, you know, come to class here, drive to WIBX and take the skills I was learning at the time and apply them immediately. Now, I was fortunate not everybody had that that opportunity when you're in college to do it professionally at the same time, but that experience was incredible, and I would not have had that opportunity and to cross that bridge and get into a professional opportunity like that if it weren't for coming here to Herkimer and a friend of mine, shout out Big Big Papa Gary Spears, still there on you the go. air Absolutely. in Utica, saying, "Yeah, hey, I know this guy he does a sports show. He's got an internship. Is that something you'd be into?" Like that's so important to have those connections and the opportunities that that leads you to even where I am today. Yeah, and it's amazing, and it's all about getting your hands on doing things. It, it really is. I mean, the, you know, it's great to learn technique I, it, and getting a well-rounded education. We were just talking in the last episode with Aaron Alford, just about actually, like you said, going out there and doing it. That's what you have to do, and especially now. I mean, come on, you can start a podcast today. You can start a YouTube show today. Even just on social media, what you can do, the short videos and Instagram, TikTok's kind of a, a weird situation right now. It might not even be around yeah. in six months, <laughs> but it's amazing what you can do. And you don't need the, I hate to say it because I think college is, is still a, a, a ground where you need to go and, and train and learn and, and be a part of it. My daughter's 18 and she's about to go into college in the fall as well. I still think that's part of it, but it's the best of both worlds, right? You learn the techniques, you learn from the professionals, but then you can just go do it. You know, back in my day when I was in college, we had the student station and I had other opportunities, but nowhere near the amount of opportunities you have. Just go out and literally do what you want to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you graduated from Herkimer in 1999, I believe you That's said. That's correct. Yep. So tell us about your first job coming out of college. So coming out of college, my first job was at uh, professionally in terms of media. So I was working at WIBX while I was at Herkimer. So when I graduated here in 1999, I actually spent a semester at Oswego. And it was interesting. It was one of the biggest arguments I ever had with my father because he was pretty set on, we were just talking about college, right? You need to go to get a four-year degree and go to college like he had that mindset. And I was trying to tell him, like, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm actually kind of doing what I want to do. I work at a radio station while I'm at college. And see, again, this is before the Internet. <laughs> this is before streaming. My dad's in Syracuse. I'm out here in the Mohawk Valley. He can't hear what I'm doing. Like, he hears about it, and I would tell him about it, and I would play him some tapes. But it's not like he could sit down and listen to it on his phone or stream it like you can now. So sure. it didn't really process with him that I was actually doing what I wanted to do. So I lost that argument, and I went to Oswego for a semester. Oswego's great, great opportunity, great school, but I was not happy because I was doing what I wanted to do at WIBX. So thankfully, after one semester at Oswego, I talked to some people at WIBX, and they took me back and to some opportunities I was doing there before. I was producing a radio show. I was doing news. I was dressing up as the mascot Tukey the mascot, <laughs> light 98.7, the big parrot going to like grocery store openings, making, you know, 25 bucks, whatever they needed me to do, right? So when I, that was my first real opportunity, right? Coming back to the place that allowed me to work there while I was in college. And I was producing a sports watch with Brad Davies on WIBX, doing news, doing a whole bunch of things there. And shortly after I came back in, this is now in early 2000, Brad got an opportunity to go to Rochester. So here I am, just out of college, 
had been there and they knew me, right? But I'm 22 years old. I'm named the sports director at WIBX doing Sports Watch. Uh, WIBX, we did, you know, sports updates and news that we broadcast the Boilermaker. Uh, I can't remember if we had the Utica Blue Sox at the time, but I know there was some involvement there. It was, it was a right in the fire, a full-time opportunity as a sports director. And I thankfully had learned from Brad and kind of saw what he did and had a sense of what that job was. But I still was like, you sure you want to just hand this over to me? Like, I know how to talk sports. Right. But it was all the other stuff you had to learn, right? But that's so important. Well, for a 22-year-old, it doesn't get better than that. Oh, it absolutely doesn't get better than that. But, Scott, what I had to learn was how to work with the sales department. Like, this is a business, right? How do they sell your show? And sure. about all the aspects of the business and the responsibility of it and just all those things that – they did teach you in college, but you really have to learn while you're doing it. So it was a lot. It was it was a lot kind of thrown on my plate at the same time, and you just kind of had to swim your way through it. But, you know, you took all that and you springboarded that into even more opportunities later down the road. Yeah, that that's what I was lucky to do. So while I was there at WIBX, I was there from, from 96 to 2002 total, but as the sports director from 2000 to 2002. And so, look, I'm from Syracuse, and I grew up going to Syracuse University, football and basketball games. That was as if I lived in New York City and would cover the Yankees, if I lived in Chicago and got to cover the Chicago Bears. Like, that was my professional team. So I got a call in 2002 from Jim Lurch, who was the program director at Sports Radio 620 WHEN, station that no longer exists anymore. And Adam Shine had left. Now, Adam Shine, who is still on Mad Dog Sports Radio sure, to this yep, day, still absolutely. a prominent figure out there, is a very popular host in Syracuse. And he had left. And Jim was actually, by happenstance, was driving in the car with a friend of his. And I talked a lot of Syracuse sports, even on WIBX, because there's a lot of SU fans in the Mohawk Valley. And I, was, I remember doing a segment about Dwight Freeney who was at Syracuse at the time and at this amazing season. And I, I felt like he should have been in the Heisman Trophy conversation. And Jim liked what he heard. He sent me an email. One thing led to the next. We had a conversation. And there I was. This is now July of 2002. And I'm taking over for Adam Shine. And I'm on Sports Radio 620 WHN and uh, doing pre- and post-game work on WSYR for Syracuse University Sports. I'm 26 now. And my dream's coming true. Like, can you imagine, like, being handed your dream job in the only place you've ever wanted to work at that age, talking sports every day? Now, following Adam was, that was a challenge. Adam was very popular, and I was able to kind of connect with the audience and kind of build on, on what Adam did. But there, that was a lot of pressure to step in there and do it. And, look, it's kind of like a Syracuse basketball player that stays home there's a little extra pressure on them. Sure right? there is. Sure. It's one thing to be like an SU grad that steps into a job like that in whatever market it shall be. But Syracuse fans, they know their history. They know their teams. But that was an advantage for me, Scott, because, man, I was there when Pearl Washington hit that half-court shot in 1984. I was there in 1987 when Michael Owens took it in the corner of the end zone on that two-point conversion to beat West Virginia. So it was relatable. I could from day one say, I know what we're, we're, we're doing here because I was there and I know it and I know these players and I know these coaches. And Jim Beheim's got to run more man to man defense and right away, just relating to that audience. But you still wanted to do the best show you could for them every day and, and respect and appreciate the passion that they had for their teams, be it Syracuse football, basketball, whatever the case may be. And I had that passion. So that was the easy part. The challenge was every day you sit down and you had to just create this show and entertain people and engage people and inform people and keep them engaged in your show and then come on back tomorrow and we'll do the whole darn thing all over again. Right. And the, the mic time was actually probably the easy part, really. Yes. Between all the preparation and everything else that goes into it. But, you know, you, you mentioned, like, the sports history in Syracuse, and, and I'm right with you. I'm right about your age. And I remember, like, those Big East games 
way back in the day. They were like wars. Yeah. And it was it was an incredible I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, the ACC is wonderful. I'm just, you know, going back in time thinking about all those times with uh. the Big East and you know, like when Syracuse was playing Penn State a lot in football and in just all those old days. Incredible what you got to see. It really was. And I'm gonna sound like such an old man now, but <laughs> There was nothing like it. The best way I can tell a younger audience about this is to go watch that ESPN 30 for 30 Requiem for a Dream. Yes. And that will show you what the Big East was and what it meant. And, man, the way those teams used to go at it. And Bay- and it, there was the personality, and not only of the players, but the coaches, Bayheim. John Thompson, Louis Carnesecca with his sweaters at St. John's, Rolly Massimino at Villanova, and those games, man, they meant everything. I mean, I brought up the Pearl Washington shot and the SU Georgetown games back in the day, 30,000 people. You'd have, you know, Brent Musburger and Billy Packer yes. courtside and the big feel of it. Like, there's just nothing like it. And it just all just ended. And when Syracuse went to the ACC – in 2014, it's been a decade now, they had to do it. That's the business of college right. sports. understandably, with the money involved. Sure. Of course. But it just feels so sanitized. It just feels like, and we're in an era now where college sports has never felt less like college sports, right? Because there's money in college sports now that's never been there before. And right. Being a fan of those Big East days and Syracuse in those days, It felt like college sports. Now, Syracuse is a unique market, as we said, because that is the pro team for people that grow up in central New York but didn't go to Syracuse. Like, there's a difference between the the townies like me that just went to the games and fell in love with the program for that feel and and alums, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's such an interesting mix, and it's so hard to feel that connection these days. Because the line between professional and college sports, it, it doesn't exist anymore. All what we're hearing about, television deals, name, image, and likeness, everything that's happening in college sports, that's what professional sports does. So it's funny. I just read a story the other day. Ken Severer, the chancellor at Syracuse, he's on this commission that they're trying to basically change college football as we know it. And he even said it himself that the current model of college sports is dead. And he's right. So where we're going and what it's going to be, we'll see. But you still want to feel that connection. You still want to feel the unique aspect of what college sports is. And unfortunately, that that just barely exists these days. You're so right because back then, uh, a lot of the players, a lot of the athletes stayed for all four years. So if you watch, say, like a Sherman Douglas from his freshman year, you felt like you grew up with him as he went through his career. And I'm just using Sherman as the example. But, I mean, it, it's now – and you, you can't blame players for wanting to leave early to go make you know, massive contracts in pro sports. Who the heck could blame them? Certainly not me. But you're right. It does kind of – you know, okay, they're going to be here for a year or two, and we know this. Well, you know what? It used to be because they were good enough to go to the pros. But now you have the transfer portal. Exactly. Every year. Now, don't get me wrong. It's pretty interesting <laughs> for somebody like me to cover this stuff, right? As I like to say to my audience, I don't root for your team, but I do root for interesting. Every year you have free agency in college sports these days. And players can play the market. They can put them their name in the transfer portal and seek a better opportunity, not only for playing time, but for name, image, and likeness money. It doesn't work out for all those guys, but it's so hard to connect as a fan. Like, why am I going to invest my time into, I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, but just look at a recent example. Why am I going to invest in Malik Brown? And then he could just walk out the door exactly. a year later. So I think Jerry Seinfeld said it, you're rooting for laundry. You know, you got to root for the, <laughs> the front sure. of the jersey, not the back. But why is, amongst various reasons, Scott, why are we seeing this explosion in popularity in women's college basketball right now? Names. Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, stars that stay two, three, four years. Paige Becker's at UConn. The coaches are stars. Kim Mulkey, Gino Ariema, Dawn Staley, right? You need that. That's, that's what the Big East had. They had these big names and these Absolutely. personalities. Even Derek Coleman, 
You said he was the number one pick in the draft. He stayed for four years. Billy Owens was a top three pick in the draft. He stayed for three years. It all culminated and changed Carmelo Anthony. One and done guy. Right. But think of even 20 years later, the effect he has on recruiting. This player that Syracuse got recently, transferred by the name of Eddie Lampkin from Colorado, cited Carmelo Anthony as a reason that he wanted to come to Syracuse and make that connection. So it can go both ways. You can have that kind of impact even as a one-and-done guy. But it is so hard to invest your time emotionally into these things when there's always that threat that the portal could come calling and they could leave. And it does go both ways, though, because the football team has been a benefactor. Sure has. Kyle McCord from Ohio State, Fidel Diggs from Texas A&M, and a number of players we can talk about. So that's my long-winded way of saying the portal giveth, the portal taketh away. But college sports is is so different, and it's fascinating to watch. Absolutely. But, you know, you talk about the rise of women's sports, and thank goodness, finally, because really that, that has been such an untapped market, so to speak, for so long. And it's great to see the women finally getting their due and being put in the spotlight. Because for the longest time, I mean, they were, and they were always great, just people didn't know. It just goes to show you that – Sports, if it's men's sports, women's sports, professional, college, you need stars. You need – so what you have to draw in, I like to call it the mom test. Like, my mother, even though her son has been doing it forever, she's not a huge sports fan. She never has been. She kind of lives vicariously through me, right? If my mom knows who Caitlin Clark is, if my mom knows who certain players are, that tells me it has gone to an audience that's not engaged every day. That's not into it. That's the kind of audience you need to round out anything in sports, right? So you said it. Women's college basketball has always been great. There's always been great teams. There have been stars in the past. But with social media, the growth of media, it's still star-driven. You need that draw. You need a reason to sit down and watch, even if you're not a fan of that particular sport. But, man, I like that player, right? And that's what we're seeing with college sports. So I guess that's going to be the challenge going forward. Absolutely. Who's the next in line? But but look at, you know, Caitlin Clark and Paige Beckers and some of these names. They were inspired by not only the names that came before them in women's college basketball. Look how Steph Curry changed the game. Sure. Right? Sure. Now you have a whole generation of kids that want to be Steph Curry. So now you got a whole generation of young women that want to be Caitlin Clark. And that's great for the sport. It absolutely is. No doubt about it. Uh, you mentioned the football team, of course. The, yeah, the transfer portal has been very, very good to them. Uh, why do you think that all of a sudden Syracuse has become this premier destination for these football players to come to? Fran Brown is the easy answer to that. Fran has come in and has these connections. And where it, it's central right now, you, you start with what you know and who you know. He's a Jersey guy. He's a Camden, New Jersey guy. And that is where he has recruited That's where even when he was at Georgia, when he was at Temple, at Baylor, he had that connection in a talent-rich area in the Northeast, particularly to Jersey, right? So Fran comes in. He knew he had connections with certain players that he could bring in right away. Kyle McCord at Ohio State, Fidel Diggs at Texas A&M, a player that was at Syracuse, left and came back, Deuce Chestnut, right? He knew he had all these players. So what Fran did is he came in, used the portal to Syracuse's advantage by tapping into those connections. So right away, he's showing receipts. Usually a coach comes in and they tell you, here's what I want to do. Fran Brown came in from day one and said, here's what I'm doing. So that not only paid off in the transfer portal, he had those connections recruiting-wise, right? Now, he's coming from Georgia. That's going to help get you in some rooms, in some conversations. Absolutely. That you probably wouldn't get in if you're Syracuse. Because as we were talking about with Caitlin Clark and personalities, look, do you commit to Syracuse University as a football player? Yes. But you're mostly committing to the coach. This is the guy that's going to guide you, that's going to lead you, that's going to be there, that you connect with for four years. You sign up for coaches more than you do programs. It goes both ways. So Fran had those connections, had those players, got them to come in. Frankly, name, image, and likeness has helped. There were some donors at Syracuse that weren't as involved 
before because you know, for whatever reason they just w- did not connect with Dino Babers that way. Dino Babers kind of had this weird philosophy about alums being around the program, and that turned some people off. The results of the football program in recent years turned some people off. So when Fran came in and immediately started showing receipts and building players and not saying this is what I want to do, here's what we're doing, it invigorated a lot of those donors and a lot of the people that were maybe passive before, and they're all in now because they believe in his vision and, and what he wants to do with Syracuse. Absolutely. And you actually have a podcast of your own. I, I do. Syracuse yeah. Sports with Brian Axe. Yeah. And, of course, you cover the Orange extensively on that. I'm going to show a clip from that show right now because I think it's very important that the work that you do for the football team. So we're going to show that clip, and when we come back, we're going to discuss the clip, and we're going to continue talking about Syracuse sports. We'll be right back. When you make a change, snap a finger, and everything that is evident in college sports today with the transfer portal, the new guys in command from day one, it's fascinating how that can flip itself on its head there, and McCord comes in as, as the number one guy from the get-go here. Okay, and we are back with Brent Axe from Syracuse.com. Great episode. I, I love you. your show. Thank you. You know, and we were we were talking about the football team. We went to the break. Let's continue to talk about them. It looks good this season. I'll tell you what. This team, a year ago, without its quarterback at the end, scraping by with – LaQuint Allen and Dan Villari going old school, playing quarterback. That team made a bowl game, right? So I'm looking at this team that has upgraded a quarterback, that has all these transfers coming in, that has impact recruits coming in, and I think they've got a schedule that is very favorable. Syracuse does not play Clemson this year. Syracuse does not play Florida State this year. Syracuse does not play North Carolina this year. So if they can come out of the chute, pick up some non-conference wins, hold their own in the ACC, it is not crazy to suggest that this could be a nine-win football team this year. I mean, think of what they did last sure, year. Sure, sure. got into a bowl Absolutely game. believe With all the injuries and a tougher schedule and everything they went through, the coach was about to get fired, all the distractions that were there. This team can be two or three wins better than that, right? Now, the trick is so much has to come together at once, Right. You've got a new offense, you've got a new defense, a new philosophy, a new coach. There's no preseason in college football. Like, it's got to come together quickly. So that's going to be the trick. And I feel like that non-conference schedule for Syracuse, you know, you start with Ohio. There are There's a couple conference games that sneak in early on the schedule. Georgia Tech comes in early, so it's a mix. So there'll be enough of a, a runway for Syracuse to establish itself, but also some some tougher games that will challenge it early on. But all things considered, Scott, like, I think this could be a nine-win football team. And I'm going to tell you this. Syracuse has had, and you know I love you guys, but Syracuse can be a fair-weather sports town, okay? (laughs) They're going to sell out every home game this year because the fever pitch, the interest, and here's here's kind of the cheat code. Remember, the Dome's going to have about 7,000 less seats than usual. They're restructuring the Dome this summer. Oh, I did not know that. They're remodeling. So they've been doing this remodeling project for the past few years. The next phase of that is the new seats. Okay. So when the new seats go in, it's actually going to reduce capacity at the Dome. They're getting rid of those uncomfortable silver benches that have been there since. <laughs> we, we had to bring know. the foam pad with you. Yes, yes. <laughs> Many backs have suffered in watching Syracuse basketball games and football games. But now the whole Dome is going to be seats. So it's going to go from a capacity of football about 50,000 to 42, 43,000. So it's easier to sell out now, right? You got 7,000 less seats. You got a, a community that's going crazy that wants to see this team. And I think you're going to see every game sell out or, or down, darn close to it. I just need the Dome Ranger. Remember him? Oh, he was the best. Still in Syracuse. Is he? Shout out Dennis Brogren, <laughs> Dome Ranger. He was Great awesome. guy. Uh, local businessman. Still around. I don't think he can run around like he used to back in the day, but. <laughs> That was, you know, that's the thing. Like, the Dome back in the day, it had you had characters like that. You'd see the same fans and the Dome Ranger and, oh, God, I'm going Dome Eddie and the Dome Knitter. And there's just all these unique characters that were there that you saw game in and game out and uh, still passionate fans to this day. But, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> – hearing you say that reference, I'm thinking back now. Dennis yeah. running around with his cowboy hat and his <laughs> – 
That was so much fun. <laughs> well, and it's true. And, you know, back then, too, the dome was a huge attraction in itself because not there weren't a lot of domes no. except for yeah. massive cities. And so for Syracuse to have a dome was a very, very unique thing, especially for recruiting. Well, think about it. You went from Manly Fieldhouse. Yeah. Which, what, five, 6,000 people, which was a massive home court advantage because the fans are right on top of you, the Manly Zoo, as they called it back in the day, to this cavernous, huge... 50,000-seat football stadium. I can understand why even Jim Beheim back in the day, and some people were a little skeptical of, you want us to play basketball <laughs> in there? But it's a credit to the Big East, Big as we East, talked yeah. about earlier, and, and the program, and, yeah, the draw of this building. And to this day, Scott, so think about it. We're talking about the renovations there. The the new scoreboard that's in there, the new uh, technology. JMA Wireless is now, of course, the, the lead – name sponsor of the dome and as a fan you want to have access while you're at the game the game's not good enough anymore it's good enough for you and me exactly right? exactly my dad said we're going to a Syracuse game Psh, I was happy but now you want to get on your phone to for whatever reason access stats social media that kind of thing so the technology is better the food is better in the dome the experience is better because of the scoreboard and the 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 ring graphics that they have there and uh it was sad to see the old uh roof go but i don't think a shout out to pete sala at syracuse who's the the dome master like those big snowstorms sure when they had to melt the the snow off the roof they don't have to do that anymore Right. right so even what are we now the dome opened in 1980 even in 2024 there's still something unique about the draw of that building and going into that building and the unique home advantage it is for football, for basketball, for lacrosse. But they did have to, it's almost like Dome 2.0, right? Like you had to adjust to the modern amenities of college sports. And even all these years later, it's still a draw and an attraction, but for a whole different way. Sure, sure, absolutely. And like I said, it's just great to see that being brought back to life so to speak. It, it really is. Because, yeah, back in the day, that was enough. But to get people to invest in going to a game, parking, food, tickets, the whole deal, like, you got to – there are so many other entertainment options these days, you got to make it worth your while. That's the Certainly. challenge every day, Although especially you, in this day. You did say that the food's better. I'm going to have to probably disagree with you a little bit because you still can't beat an old-school dome dog. I, I – I'm sorry, I can't. I'm not going to disagree with that. <laughs> Cold hot dogs, warm beer back in Absolutely. the day. Absolutely. Dome foam. Let's go. You know, I don't need any of these fancy things they're, they're selling these days. I'm pretty happy. I'm pretty simple yeah. myself. We were so but easy to entertain. If yeah. you do need the fancy schmancy stuff, they, they got that for you too, right? <laughs> Having wine at a, at, a, at a sporting event is never my thing, but it's there if you need it, I guess. Absolutely. So you're at Syracuse.com now. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit. Obviously, you're, you're covering orange sports. Uh, base, or I'm sorry, basketball, football, lacrosse? Lacrosse is, is in the mix now. So I'm the uh, sports columnist at Syracuse.com. I also, you brought up the podcast, and thank you for promoting that. It's been fascinating to, to get into that world a little bit. So the podcast is a mix of we do live post games after Syracuse football and basketball, but also a podcast like this where we have on guests and have conversations and have fun and do different topics like drafts and lists. And I, this is what I love about doing a podcast you know, a radio show, you're kind of chained to the events of the day, right? What happened today? Let's talk about that. A podcast is a mix of the two. We're talking about the game that we saw last night, or in the case of a post-game show, the game we just watched. But it's also like, hey, let's form the Mount Rushmore of Syracuse basketball players all time. Have a conversation like that. Talk to one of my favorite recent interviews is I got to talk to Ian Eagle who is now the voice of the Final Four for CBS. Right, that's, for, that's awesome. Uh, he's an incredible. And being in Syracuse, you just have this treasure trove of sports broadcasters that, that went to Syracuse, right? Have people like that on. So I just love the challenge of let's put a show together that's going to engage our audience and get into that world. And you, you brought it up with football and, and, foot, and basketball and lacrosse and all the different sports that we're covering these days. People can't get enough of what's going on with the football team, even in spring practice, right? It's, like, it's just practice, but people have so many questions 
about what's going on with the team, what we see, and, and they just can't get enough of it. So I've got my, my column and, and my podcast, but a unique aspect of my job now is we have this tech service. We're, we call it Syracuse Sports Insiders. So our insiders, it's two weeks free, but then it's three ninety nine a month, little plug. They can text me directly. They can text me their questions, their comments, their opinions, and I text them. So being a Syracuse Sports Insider, it's kind of unique because they kind of get the inside scoop on, you know, guys, here's some stories that I'm chasing down. Here's what I'm hearing about this, right? They get any breaking news that I have, they get it texted directly to their phone first. You know, I, I, broke, I broke the story that Fran Brown was coming in, that he had signed a contract. They got it first. Kyle McCord transfers to Syracuse. They got it on their phone first before it went anywhere else. Twitter, on Syracuse.com, anywhere, right? A few other stories. People really enjoy that connection, Scott, and I think what they really like is it cuts through the noise. Sure. Of, like, you can leave me a message on Twitter. Who knows when the heck I'm going to see that. Right, right. right. So it's amazing that, you know, I started here at Herkimer in 1996, and the media could not be more different than, than, than it is now. There's a lot of lessons I learned here back then that you still apply to this day. But even at 45 years old, having the opportunity to be in media since the time I was here at Herkimer at 18 years old, that's, that's a long time. <laughs> I'm still learning every day. Something new comes up. My bosses come to me and present something to me that I've never done before. And it's a, it's a thrill to take that on. It's a, it's a challenge to take that on. I, the worst thing you can do is say no because you, don't, because you don't know, because you're afraid. Well, I don't know how to do that. Well, a year ago, I didn't know how to do a podcast. I didn't know how to edit video. I didn't know how to do all these things that I'm tasked with doing now. That's not a reason to say no. You just kind of figure it out. When I got hired at Syracuse.com as a blogger in 2007, I had no writing experience whatsoever. And I told the person who hired me that. And they took a chance on me because they believed in me. And they're like, we'll figure out the, the technicalities of this. We just believe in what you can bring to the table. And you're going to need that in your career. If there's any advice I can give you, and we could do an entire podcast about that, Someone's going to have to take a chance on you at some point, and you're going to have to convince them to take a chance on you at some point. And it's easier to take a chance on somebody that's flexible, but also will throw themselves into whatever that new challenge is, right? Whatever is presented to you, like this is what your job is now, the worst thing you can do is say, I don't know how to do that. No, you have to say, okay, let's go. I will learn to do that. And the more versatile you are, the more willing you are to do those things and step out of your... I know this is such cliche advice, but it's so true. It's good to have dreams and goals and, and a vision of what you want to be, but you have to step out of your comfort zone. There's no way you learn until you step out of that comfort zone and, and, and figure it out. I've had to do that in the last year, and it's probably one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me. Well, I'll tell you, that's great advice from one of the best in the biz. I, I'm, I'm serious when I say that. One last question, then we'll let you go. All right. All right. Bruce Springsteen is coming to the <laughs> GMA Wireless go. Dome. Are you going? Oh, God. I am there. I am so excited. And the reason I'm excited this time is my daughter gets to go. I've seen Springsteen. My wife and I have seen Springsteen. My daughter, who's, who's 18 and in her senior year in high school, we connect with music, right? For her to be able to experience this for the first time, I can't wait. I splurged a little bit. I got floor seats. I'm not going to tell you how much I uh, paid for those I'm, floor seats. Uh, I, I, I was looking at tickets. Of course, I, unfortunately, <laughs> I can't go to this show. But oh, yeah, sorry work, work that, interferes. Man. But I've seen them eight times, and it's it's an incredible you experience know. every time. You know, you know, it's we've incredible. been been to Albany, Long Island, whatever. I'll tell you, one of the best shows, probably the best Springsteen show I saw, right down at Vernon Downs. That was an amazing show. It was show. incredible. It was an amazing show. And you know, that part, we, you know, we went to that show thinking, oh, it's Vernon Downs. He's going to mail it in. He's going to be in no and out way. of there in two hours. Never. Four hours he went. It was incredible. I don't know if we're going to get four out of Bruce this time, so you were <laughs> lucky to be at that show. And honestly, the Dome is not the best acoustically. No, no, it's not. But it's the experience. It's right. being there. And I just can't wait for my daughter to experience this show. So, man. 
and we've had to wait. He was supposed to be here right. in September. Guess Fortunately, sick. had a little health issue. Yep. And thankfully, he's doing well and came full circle, and it's here. And I can't wait. Yeah. I absolutely can't wait. I as, as passionate as I am about sports, live music is right up there with me. I'm a, Now, I have a, two, two big passions there. One is Springsteen, and the other is 90s alternative rock. You know, when I was here at sure. Herkimer, that's <laughs> – Pearl Jam and Nirvana, Nirvana and Soundgarden, Soundgarden yeah. and uh, Alice in Chains. And, like, that's my music, and that's what I listen to. And a lot of those bands are still out there touring. I saw Professor Pitcher at a show last year. Uh, it was uh, Collective Soul right here in, in, in Utica. A lot of those bands are still out there touring. And what's great is that's the music my daughter listens to. Oh, you can't beat that. You can't beat that. And I love that. I, I'm like, I'm sorry, honey, that. <laughs> I, I infected you with the virus here <laughs> and you're listening to dad's music, but she loves it. So that's what my daughter and I really bond over. And, and I am so looking forward to that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have a blast because how can you not at a Bruce Springsteen concert? He puts on <laughs> the dude's what? 74 now. Yeah, just going strong. I don't think he's going to go four hours, but you will get your money's worth. Oh, absolutely. Every single time at a Springsteen show. Absolutely. Well, Brent, thank you for returning to Herkimer here to come on this show. We appreciate it. Uh, by all means, Syracuse.com, that's where you got to go to see Brent's work and do it because you will not be disappointed, much like you will not be disappointed at the Bruce Springsteen show. Absolutely. And look, thank you for having me. Herkimer will always have a very special place in my heart. This is where it all started for me. The people that are, are still here are amazing. I love that you're doing this, right? This thank is you. such an example of what you need to do at Herkimer. It's Thank the you advice, so much. It's the advice we gave to the class that I had the opportunity to, to, to speak with. Just do it. I'm stealing a phrase from Nike, but just do it. And congrats to you on doing this, and I can't wait to, to watch and listen in the future, my friend. Well, thank you very much. And, hey, if you're going to steal a phrase, might as well steal from Nike because they certainly made Don't it work. Sue me. A- <laughs> Don't sue me. We're just borrowing it from you. We're, we're just a college podcast. That's Leave right. Us alone. Come on. <laughs> well, Brett, thanks again. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Okay, that's all the time we got for this episode. I want to thank Brent Axe once again for coming down. A great guest, and we hope to have him back again sometime soon. And we want to thank you, the viewer, for watching. And we will see you next time on Generally Speaking. Generally Speaking.